Hello everyone, I'm Alexander Williamson and you're watching Fishtory. So today I want to go over the top 10 myths and misconceptions about filtration and your nitrogen cycle and the way bacteria even works in our aquariums. Now this is going to be a bit deeper of a dive, so if you have no understanding of the nitrogen cycle, you might want to start off on a little bit of an earlier video or a little bit more of a tutorial guide. Uh, there's lots of great ones out there. However, my goal in this video is to change the way that even seasoned aquarists think of filtration and the nitrogen cycle. And if I don't do that by myth number three, you can feel free to turn off and tune out. But all I ask is that you watch through myth number three. And if there's something that reframes the way you understand our hobby, then please continue to watch, like, and think about subscribing if you like this content. That's all I ask. So let's count them down right now. The top 10 myths and misconceptions about filtration and the nitrogen cycle. All right, so myth number one, that is that you have to cycle your tank. You need to have beneficial bacteria in your aquarium for your fish to survive. And that's frankly just not true. So let's start off right there. There are pet shops all around the world and there are bags of fish shipping all around the world that don't have any filtration, they don't have any cycle, they are just clean water. We need a filter and our nitrogen cycle so that we can keep homeostasis or so that we can keep equilibrium in our ecosystem long term. But if you were to have a constant drip of water changing out of your aquarium all the time and that replaced quick enough, you would not need it. In many river systems and things, there is nitrogen bacteria, but it's not constantly uh, cycling the river per se. Uh, that happens more in ponds and lakes. There's far less nitrogen bacteria, uh, nitrogen eating and processing bacteria that is, than there is in our aquariums, for instance. So that's myth number one. Let's move on to myth number two. All right, moving along into myth number two. That is that our aquariums are a full cycled system. Well, if you think about the word cycle, like a rainwater cycle, it rains and then it goes into the, the, the ground, it settles out, it drains into a lake or aquifer, then the sun evaporates, it goes up into the clouds, and then it rains again. It's a big cycle. Well, in our aquariums, we're adding stuff to it. And other than trace elements and asteroids and things, our Earth doesn't have things being added to it. It's a self-contained cycle. So the way we say a cycled aquarium is not really the best way to think about it. It is a system in which we are adding nitrogen and carbon and other things, but mostly nitrogen and carbon too, in the form of fish food, fish that pass away if you don't take them out, and plants that deteriorate, that melt, that shed, and so forth. That either then builds up in the substrate, which we call sequestration, or it builds up in a chemically bound process to a filter or to some sort of uh, uh, BCB system if you're running that st type of filtration. But even then, you're not necessarily taking it, you are taking it out of the system, that is to say. You are not leaving it in a system and refueling the system over and over. Now, algae is kind of one of the exceptions, or maybe duckweed if you have goldfish or something that eats duckweed. Then that plant is taking the nitrates, nitrites, ammonia, and processing it, and your fish are eating it, and then it's kind of cycling around. But beyond that, every time you add food, you're adding something to the system, and it either has to turn into plants and grow up and out, or you have to do water changes. And that's why it's not truly a cycle, a closed cycle. And uh, a lot of people now are very fascinated with trying to get closer to those closed cycles. And if you're interested in that, we talk about filterless tanks and closer to closed cycles or holistic ecosystems and seasoned tanks rather than cycled tanks uh, on my channel quite a bit. So check out the other videos on that. Moving right along to number three. 
So myth number three is that ammonia is toxic to plants and to your animals, your fish. Now, part of this is true. Ammonia is not good for your fish. It is toxic. That's why they expel it. That's why we expel it at the end of the day or, you know, when you got to use the restroom. But ammonia is a gas suspended in the water, just like chlorine can be. And it only stays in the water when the pH is above 6.5. So if you have a black water tank or a very acidic tank, that cannot stay in the water just due to the laws of chemistry and physics. And it will no longer hold ammonia as a gas. However, it will hold ammonium, which is another form of ammonia. We don't have to get into all the details right now. But it's a less toxic version of ammonia called ammonium. And it's far less toxic. Now, the higher the pH you have, the more dangerous it is. But the lower the pH you have, the more of it you can hold in your water. And it is essentially, let's call it bonded and safe. It's, it's stuck to other uh, charged, opposite charged uh, molecules in the water. And so it won't harm our creatures. Now, I said that ammonia is harmful to fish. However, it's not harmful to plants in small doses. Plants prefer ammonia over nitrates and nitrites. So they actually want to be fed that, especially at the roots. They would much prefer to have ammonia. And that's something a lot of people don't know right off the bat. And that's why we get into things like deep substrate and sand caps. And that's why you would have an active substrate that traps the ammonia and active nitrites, nitrates and ammonia all together in there and your roots can access it, but your water will not leach it out and harm your fish. So that's the idea behind capping a, a substrate. And even though our fish don't like that ammonia, the ammonium that I was talking about, if you have, say, a Tanganyikan tank that's at 8.4 pH, your ammonia in that tank will not evaporate off as quickly, and in a harder water tank like that and a higher pH tank like that, say you have 100 parts per million of ammonia. That'd be a lot. Uh, or sorry, of ammonium. That's the one that doesn't evaporate off. That would be enough that your fish would start to get sick, just like they would one or two parts per million of ammonia. Now, if you have ammonium at 7.4, you could have a thousand parts per million of ammonium and it still would only be as toxic as that hundred was up at 8.4. Now you go down to 6.4, every level it's exponential. It's 10,000 times now, 10,000 parts per million uh, that would be harmful to your fish at that point. So it gets to a point where basically it's bonded in a level that it's just not going to be harmful. And below 6.4 or 5, that's kind of the cutoff where it either evaporates out or bonds and a new system kicks in. But then your nitrogen-loving bacteria that are usually used in the uh, aerobic or oxygen-rich environment filtration that we use in all the different kinds of filters in the hobby, they stop working and the bacteria goes dormant for a while until the pH returns. And that gets into a whole other giant story of all the other ways that nitrogen, carbon, and all the other elements are filtered in our aquariums, but we won't get there today. So let's move on to myth number five. All right, myth number five is that different filters have different ways of filtering water for us in our aquarium. And honestly, no matter what filter you have, whether you have a hang on the back, you have a box filter, you have a sponge filter, or you have BSB baskets or bags, or an under gravel filter, or a plenum, or even some sort of centrifugal foaming uh, separating filter that they've used in a wastewater treatment plant. There's really only three ways that we can filter our aquariums for our fish and plants. The first is mechanical, 
and that is by moving parts and using laws of physics, so the heavier something is uh, and the denser something is, it will fall and separate from the lighter. And basically then we can screen out whatever's suspended in the water. So you're letting the heavy stuff fall and either become substrate or it's getting moved around by flow in your tank and then getting pushed into the filter or sucked into the filter by air or by an electrical powered impeller, whatever it may be. And then that is your mechanical filtration. Then you have to empty that out or just let it continue to pile up in your substrate. And ideally, you are adding good things to your aquarium, so your substrate becomes richer and richer for your plants over time. We just kind of touched on that. Now, the second kind of filtration is the most important in our hobby, and that is biological filtration. And that is when you have ammonia in your tank, you have bacteria that colonizes it, that eats the ammonia and turns it into nitrites. Now nitrites are still a little harmful and they're less than ammonia to fish, but they need to be turned into nitrates to be rendered uh, less harmful or harmless enough that we can let them build up for a number of days or weeks in our aquarium. And we can either do a water change or our plants will process that slowly. Now I already mentioned, plants do prefer to eat out of the substrate at the roots if they're that kind of plant, if they're not a rhizome plant. They prefer that and they prefer the ammonia. However, if they're eating out of the water column or if they're not a root feeder, then they will prefer to eat out of the water column and that is all part of biological filtration. Now the last kind of filtration, the third kind, is chemical. And that's when you literally bond things into another form. So you've got your ammonia and you bond it to another chemical or lock it up in some sort of chemical cage. And this is similar to what we do when we dechlorinate our aquariums and sulfur surrounds in salt, sulfur in salt rings, uh, surrounds in a molecular sense, the uh, harmful chlorine until it either evaporates or dissipates. So we just use different versions of those three systems, no matter how we have filtered our aquariums thus far in history. And it's a good system, but the biological filtration is the most important. So let's pick apart that a little more and talk about some myths having to do with that. All right, now myth number six is going to be that there are only two types of bacteria and that they, that are involved in our filter. And that is that there's the kind that breaks down ammonia and there's the kind that breaks down the nitrites into nitrates. And then the cycle is complete. Well, there are thousands of bacterial species in a lot of aquariums. In an old aquarium with lots of life, lots of different types of fish and things, everything from what's in the fish's gut and probiotics and little creatures to what's in the substrate and what's on the surfaces. Bacteria lives on every surface in your tank and it handles different cycles. The nitrogen cycle is nowhere near the only cycle in our tank. There's a potassium cycle, there's a uh, oxygen cycle, there's a carbon cycle, and different bacterias help with all of these. Different bacterias have filled in the niche to handle all these different things. Now there are two distinct groups of bacteria in our aquarium. And that is when it's fully cycled, you've got beneficial bacteria. And in our hobby, we worry about the ammonia to nitrite and then the nitrite to nitrates. Uh, and sometimes if you're really into the hobby or you're really into filterless tanks, you might worry about anaerobic and anoxic bacteria that lives in the soil and uses iron and sulfur and potassium in different ways and actually eats nitrates and turns them back into ammonia, which returns it to your system. That would be a full cycle, which I just mentioned almost no aquariums are currently. But the bacterias that are of concern to us in almost every tank in the hobby today, uh, with the very few exceptions, are two. And they are from the genera or genus 
of the following groups. If they break down ammonia into nitrites, then it's either a nitrosomonas, a nitrosospira, a nitrosococcus, uh, or a nitrosolobus. And those are genera that each have hundreds of species and mutations of bacteria within them. That's just the first step. That's the ammonia to the nitrites. Now the nitrites to nitrates is either going to be a nitrobacter or a nitrospina or a nitrococcus uh, uh, genus of bacteria. Now genus, as you know, could be things like uh, you know all the different gr uh, species that are similar in a group. So there can be hundreds, there can be dozens, there can be one in a genus, but there's not just one or two bacteria. There's actually a rich diversity, and it depends on everything from temperature to the micro and macro elements to light and oxygen availability and a whole bunch of other things. And now we're also learning that a lot of these systems are also using things like yeast and fungi in ways that are also contributing to how these cycles are completed. However, traditionally, those are the groups we use for the biological step of filtration in our aquariums. All right, myth number seven is that when we filter our aquariums, we're, we're, we're leaving the good bacteria in there. And if anything happens, like our tank gets cloudy or turns green, then it is having issues, right? Well, a lot of times what makes a tank cloudy is actually dead bacteria. So a lot of times people think it's ammonia or something that builds up and causes your water to look foggy or cloudy or waste. And what it usually is, the, the first culprit, is actually the cells and the cell membranes of little bacteria or little creatures that live and uh, help process everything on the actual surface areas of our glass, of our hardscape, and of our uh, filter medias. So it's usually because they had a bunch of ammonia to eat or a bunch of nitrates, nitrites to eat, whatever that load was due to food or due to your fish going to the bathroom after they eat food or plants decaying over time they're used to this constant rate. Well, if you pulled all the plants out, one, nothing would be eating what's, what uh, the plants normally eat, and that could cause a spike in one kind, which could take over and kill another, and you could get a bloom. But likewise, you could get it from having no bacteria food. So that would be if you had ammonia and things usually coming in the tank and uh, feeding your bacteria, and all of a sudden they stop being added, they stop coming into the tank, well, those bacteria are gonna die back. And they die back and then bloom or grow or colonize as your load changes. And that's just part of life. But usually that cloudiness is not necessarily a bad sign. It can be, but it's just a sign that something's changing. That's much more important to understand. So let's get on to number eight. All right, myth number eight is simply about liquid carbon. A lot of people add it to their aquarium thinking that carbon comes with filter packs and therefore I'll add it to the water. And they either think that it's some sort of substitute for CO2 for their plants, which doesn't have to do with filtration, or that it is something that's going to chemically bond with uh, something in the tank and, and clean things up, right? Well, I'm here to tell you that's not what liquid carbon's for. It's for enriching your plants, in, in theory, I guess. Uh, but there's actually very limited roles for liquid carbon. Usually what it's there for is as an algicide, and it turns into glutaraldehyde, which is a compound that, that the carbon there bonds with and kills algae. So unless you're using it to control algae, Really, that's what liquid carbon's role is. But we're gonna talk about that carbon that comes in your hang off the back filters and in a lot of aquarium filters you buy at the store because myth number nine involves those. And when you buy those in a kit, they tell you to put a cartridge with the uh, broken up activated carbon or charcoal uh, in there. 
And for myth number nine, it's that you need to change that or that that even needs to be there. Now, that's only there for very fine particle removal. Activated carbon or biochar or charcoal, as whatever you want to call it, is when wood is burned at a very high temperature with no oxygen and it retains the structure with the lignin and cellulose of the wood and it looks like a banded ring that has holes in it where it's been carbonized and basically it's missing pieces. So it looks like rings of Swiss cheese and because of that, it's almost like a sponge if you were to look at it under the microscope. And things get into that sponge and they clog it up. Pretty soon, and I'm talking anywhere from 24 hours after you start your aquarium to five days, seven days, maybe a week max, that is going to be plugged. All those little holes deep in the, the charcoal, they're going to be plugged. And then all it becomes is more surface area for your bioactive filtration. So all those beneficial bacterias will colonize uh, that surface and into it slightly, but it's just going to get clogged up and you might as well throw it out. What it's really for is for adding in there to filter out chemicals because they are uh, so small, they're smaller than little bits of dust and things that are in your aquarium and they're going to get caught in that charcoal, just like we charcoal filter alcohol, like <laughs> vodkas and things. Um, you're going to charcoal filter or just like a Brita tap, uh, will, uh, Brita filter on your tap, that will filter those chemicals out. So save that little packet that comes with it. And if you ever need to dose antibiotics or an antiparasitical, then you can add that that packet back to the system and filter it out, then take it out and throw it away, go get some more uh, carbon. Now, this brings me to number 10, and this is the biggest myth, uh, probably for beginners, but also for people that I've met that keep fish for a long while. And it has to do with these kits we buy and the hang off the back filters or canister filters and all the things that come in them. So let's talk about that as our last myth Number 10. So speaking of myth number 10, when you get a system like this, a hang off the back system, you'll see on the box that there are a number of filters in here. You've got your mechanical filter, which uh, has a filter here, and you can add a pre-filtered sponge, which will add more back bacterial or biological filtration before things are worked into the system, which is great. You can buy those aftermarket. Places like Aquarium Co-op and now even Petco, PetSmart seem to carry things like that. And then once it goes up into the system, spins around, the debris falls down into here. And you've got a coarse sponge and then a finer sponge. And then you've got a bag full of beads <laughs> a bag full of little rocks or, or bead looking things that are porous. And in some cases, then you'll either get a finer filter mesh uh, or charcoal that slides in here. Now the ones that sell you charcoal and the other kind of uh, slide in or blade style filter, that's just fine polishing filter. And some people want to take that to the nth degree and have no particulate matter in their aquariums. However, I let my plants, my moss, and the pre-filter sponge, plus just the settling within a canister or a hang off the back filter, take care of that. It's plenty if you set it up properly. And your microbes will keep the water clear if you've got enough oxygen and flow going to it as well. However, the main parts that may look familiar, here's a sponge filter. Uh, it's got the mechanical filtration lifting and not doing much other than that, other than bringing it to the bacterial uh, filter or the biological filter. And that's where all your good bacteria is colonizing. All those kinds we talked about are all living on a sponge filter. Yet running air through this so that it pulls water through, that's enough to filter a tank, just this. But you may get cloudier water and that's why people add the next layer of filtration. 
or bio beads or a blade style thing, or they use something like filter floss, which is just fluff from a pillow, usually acrylic or some sort of non biodegradable thing that is going to over time have a lot of surface area, fray, and catch both particulate matter and just be more biological bacteria uh, space uh, to catch it and grow it. But you can buy a giant bag of this, like a big old bag of it, several cubic feet of it for 20 or $30 and use that throughout the entire hang off the back filter or put an air stone in the center of a glob of it basically and just put rubber bands around it and that would still work to pull the uh, water through that's oxygenated and that has the bacteria on this. Now, to which degree you want to do this, that's up to you, but you definitely don't need to go buy new blades every month, uh, nowhere near that. And if you buy things like uh, poly pad or polishing pads, you can actually just use a piece that you can rinse out if you want that fine uh, filtration. And it'll do the roll almost as good as like charcoal uh, does in polishing the last bits of little pieces that are coming through your filtration system each time. So those are the 10 myths and misconceptions I wanted to talk about in the filtration and nitrogen cycle world. And I hope that you guys enjoyed this. And if you did, I'd always appreciate it if you guys like and subscribe, of course. But also, I want to thank you guys because today's video was sponsored by you, you patrons, you channel members. It's only $1.99 and you guys keep work like this coming out of this channel every few days and two live streams a week, travels around the country, better gear, so on and so forth. So you have your fellow viewers to thank for that and I have you to thank for that. So thank you so much for your time and I'll see you guys next time on Fishery.